Uh, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. How many of you were in Omaha in 1993? Just a few of you, right? That was the 20th. There's a huge conference for the 25th year anniversary of Humanae Vitae. A thousand uh, people showed up. And this conference almost rivals uh, that conference. Plus, there's been, there's going to be, total, so my count is somewhere around 40 different conferences in the United States this year on Humanae Vitae or featuring Humanae Vitae in some way. So that shows the the interest in that. Um, I'd like to thank Father for his, his introduction. He said I, my work is almost perfect. And I have to say, I, I, I just published uh, two books, or edited two books. One was of my own uh, writings called Self-Gift, uh, published essays on Humanae Vitae and the thought of John Paul II. And another one, Humanae Vitae is Still Right, uh, published by Ignatius Press. I believe both of them are here are available. but. When I got the one on self-gift, my own essays, all of which have been published, some of them several times, edited several times, and I open it up, and the first page, I see a mistake. <laughs> right? And that's just the kind of thing that makes you want to throw it up against a wall and jump off a cliff. But I suppose that's an overreaction. Um, and I did become a consecrated virgin some six or seven years ago. Uh, and an advanced age, right? So I, I reckon it's been wonderful. It's changed my life uh, extraordinarily. So I recommend any young woman who's thinking about it to do it sooner rather than later, right? Because uh, it's been great. And I think one of my jokes about that is that Jesus and I had cohabited for years and <laughs> he decided to make an honest woman out of me. So, <laughs> and if that's the case with you, do it sooner rather than later, because it, it really is great. All right, so today I'm going to be giving you a bit of the history of Humanae Vitae and how it was received and a little bit of where we are today, and I'll do more this afternoon on the good news and, and bad news. Uh, I'm starting to be one of the older people in the room. Maybe that's even an understatement. <laughs> Maybe for some time I have been, but I haven't. My mother always told me, you don't, you don't realize how old you are. My mother used to tell me that. I called her, some of you follow me on Facebook, I call her the beloved aged mother, and I was, took care of her in her dementia. I was, so she was BAM, and beloved aged mother. And I was bad, uh, the beleaguered aging daughter. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I used to tell her she was, I, I was old, and she was ancient. So I'm an old, I was old and she was ancient. At any rate, back in 1968, uh, I was just 18 years of age and I didn't really, uh, Humanae Vitae didn't dent my awareness uh, in the least. But when it came out in 1968, it, it virtually changed the church uh, extraordinarily for the next 50 years. Right? And it really was the beginning of the major movement of dissent within the church. And those of you who have only known the church, since 1968 have known a very different church from one that was before that time. It was a, it was a pivotal point in the church. I honestly think we might be at, at the, on another one right now, um, both because of Amoris Laetitia and also because of uh, the McCarrick case and coming more concerns about um, homosexual presence uh, in the priesthood. Things are gonna get rocky uh, for some time. They were very rocky in 1968. The similarities between 1968 and, and 2018 are a little bit eerie, right? When my students tell me, you know, how it just seems like everything's in turmoil and incredible division in the government and, and the world and in the church, I say, oh, it's, for me, in a sense, it's deja vu all over again, all right? This was the cover of Time magazine when Humanae Vitae came out, a picture of Pope Paul the six and a banner across the top of it that says rebellion in the Catholic Church. And that was true. Rebellion started. I'll say more about that. But 1968 was the beginning of uh, all sorts of radical activity. There was demonstrations all the time. Um, radicals, hippies, SDS at Reed College. It was the same year that uh, Dr. King was assassinated and Kennedy was shot. Robert Kennedy. Four years earlier, her brother John was shot. And honestly, my generation was one that was not surprised to hear about the assassination of leaders. We thought it was going to continue. <laughs> Luckily, it didn't. But 
1968 was a year when those things were happening. In 1968, there were riots uh, on the streets, uh, police brutality. There was um, draft dodgers burning their draft cards. There was recorded uh, killings of the Vietnamese by the Viet Cong and others. There were uh, demonstrations for civil rights even at the Olympics. Right? There was Gloria Steinem, foremost feminist. She was the one who told us that uh, a woman needs a husband like a fish needs a bicycle. Anybody remember that? All right. Men were unimportant. Men were, in fact, harmful and best to live without them. There was a lot of uh, agitating for making legal abortion in 1968. Uh, there was bra burning in 1968. Nothing like the, the pink women's marches that are happening now. They are very foul and offensive. But a lot of this sort of thing was happening in 1968. There was the population bomb was published by Paul Ehrlich. I thought the world was absolutely going to be starving by the 1990s because of too many people. When I was in school, there were globes, posters of globes with so many people on it <clears throat> that bodies were falling off the globe. It was the year when um, the Beatles uh, were, uh, came into play. And I think, oddly, they were kind of shocking to people's sensibility. They had long hair, all right? Uh, not that they were shocking as Elvis Presley, as you recall, who appeared on the Ed Sullivan show and they would only um, film him waist up because of all his hip gyrations, right? So we were a little bit more delicate uh, culture than we are now. There was a huge change in women's fashions from the maxi skirt to the mini skirt. And just look how modest the mini skirt was then. <laughs> and of course, we were just a, on a good time roll of drugs and sex and all sorts of nonsense. Now I mentioned in 1968, I was a, a senior in high school. That's my senior high school picture. I look the same, don't I, a lot, boys? Anyway, um, I went to Grinnell College in Iowa, which was then a very, and is now even more radical than it was in 1968. I grew up in a small conservative town in Pennsylvania. Uh, my family was one of the few Democrats in town, and my father was for civil rights, and against the Vietnam War, so we were considered to be radicals. And I wanted to go to a school that was a radical school. I didn't have any idea what that meant, honestly. I, I thought it meant being pro-civil rights and against the Vietnam War. And I went off to look at the colleges, and Grinnell got on my radar screen somehow. And when I went visiting the college, there was some uh, student who had sideburns, beautiful sideburns, well into his cheeks. And that sealed the deal for me, all right? <laughs> So I want you to know I've always been, as I say, shallow all the way down. Um, so I went to Grinnell College, and uh, in the second semester, third, fourth semester I was there, some women came to campus who were trying to liberalize the abortion laws in uh, Iowa. And I honestly, I was 19 years of age, and I had never heard of, con of abortion, never heard of it. It was possible to be 19 in 1969, it was then, and never heard of abortion. So on my way to the meetings, I stopped at the library and read up on it. And I was shocked, I was just shocked that women did that thing. My mother had a baby when I was 13, 11, and another when I was 13, and that was just, <laughs> that was tremendously wonderful for me. I just loved babies, right? And when I heard that women would, you know, scrape the babies out of their wombs, I thought, oh my gosh, what is this? And then it said that the Catholic Church was opposed to abortion. And I'd, I had, was lapsed for maybe at most a year, year and a half from the Catholic Church. But that was part of that time. But it was still interesting to me. I thought, oh, the Catholic Church has a position on this. And then it said that uh, the big question was when human life begins. That's the key question in respect to abortion. So I walked off, went off to this meeting. And as the, at the end of the meeting, I raised my hand. And in the most complete naivete and simplicity, innocence, I raised my hand and I said, um, the key question here is, I said, I'm ready to write letters, I'm, I'm with you. But I said, but I wanna know when you think human life begins because that's the key question. And once it begins, then we, it obviously deserves the protection of the law. So on what basis and when do we think human life begins? I, didn't, I almost didn't know what I was asking. I just read that was the key question in the 
in the encyclopedia, right? And the response was, uh, shut up, sit down, we don't need your kind here, right? We don't need your kind here. We don't need your right to lifers. Of course, I'd never heard of right to life. And I'm looking around the rest of the room and I'm saying, what do you mean, your kind? I've been spent doing my darn best to look like everybody else on campus, right? <laughs> That's been my goal, and the goal of everybody on campus, I want to tell you, both males and females, was to look like John Lennon, all right? <laughs> now you can see you straighten my hair and put a little wire room glasses on me. I did as well as anybody else, maybe better than a lot of them, all right? Again, again I am the one on the left, all right? <laughs> um, at any rate, that was the beginning for me. That was the beginning for me, because I, uh, other students would come up to me on campus and they, they said, we hear you're opposed to abortion. I said, honestly, I don't know whether I am or not. I just, I just know what the key question is. And we started, I started talking to people and within just a couple weeks, I was one of the very few people on campus that was opposed uh, to abortion. I never meant to make a stand <laughs> against abortion. And so um, anyway, I was forevermore thought of as a, what do you call a campus character. Um, Grinnell was quite the place. We had the first um, female homecoming, I mean male homecoming queen. My parents were appalled. They came for that game and they just started tearing their hairs out where we sent our daughter. Uh, a couple years later, uh, we had a, um, a protest against Playboy magazine where 12 students um, protested by being nude in a lounge. Uh, I have no idea what that is. I mean, it made us think, of course, that nude bodies are not all that attractive to look at, so <laughs> maybe Playboy is needed, I don't know. But anyway, there was protest against Playboy. It was quite, quite the time. Uh, fast forward a couple years, and I was at uh, University of Toronto, where I had, joined, I, I had joined the pro-life group and was doing a lot of public speaking. And I went to high schools almost once a week uh, during my fifth year there. And I was, const I was regularly asked the question, well, what about contraception? Isn't that a good solution to abortion? And I'd say, well, there, there are two different issues. I'm not here to talk about contraception. Contraception uh, prevents a life from coming to be, and abortion takes a human life that's already begun. They're, they're two radically different um, acts. At the same time, I'd fallen into an incredible group of young Catholics at Toronto, uh, all intellectuals, graduate students, uh, all very enthusiastic about being Catholic. We were either converts or reverts or cradle Catholics, and our fellow graduate students, they respected us, but they couldn't believe that we were uh, wanting to be 100% Catholic. We said, we're, we're ready to defend the church. But you know, we weren't really. So we had to read Humanae Vitae. And at the end of reading it, I was convinced, as everybody else, that it was a defensible uh, uh, teaching, and that we should be prepared to defend it because we were intellectuals and intellectuals should put themselves at service uh, to the church in this way. Then I, not so long after, I got a, a job teaching at, at Notre Dame and I started doing sidewalk counseling outside of an abortion clinic and I would, these young women would be coming in and it's, it's, those of you who have done sidewalk counseling, I honestly recommend everybody do it, even if you're not up for approaching young women, stand there and pray for those who are, because it's an incredible situation where a pregnant woman is going into a building where she has a baby now, and then that baby becomes dead, is killed in the next couple hours. And you're the last, you're the last uh, re refuge against that killing. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking, what is it brings these girls here? Now, some people would say it was failed contraceptive. Most of women who get abortions were using a contraceptive at the time they got abortion. I mean, they got pregnant. But I said, you know, it's not a failed contraceptive. I said, it's a failed relationship. These women are having sex with a man with whom they have no intention of having a baby. I said, why are they doing that? Why would women do that? Have sex with someone they had no intention of having a baby? I said, it's contraception. Contraception makes them think that they can have sex without any expectation of a pregnancy. And then when a pregnancy happens, abortion. I had felt like I was at the standing outside of an abortion clinic, like I was at a place where babies were drowning and that uh, I was the last refuge to save those babies before they were killed in the abortion clinic. But then I said, you know, maybe I need to go up the river and find out why they're thrown in. And that's where this contraception throws them in. 
That's what throws the babies in the river where they drown downstream. So I said, okay, my contribution to the pro-life movement is going to be defending the church's teaching on contraception. And that's what um, God has called me to do uh, for the last 25 years. It's been an incredible ride. Um, so at the same time, at the same time, John Paul II was delivering his talks on the theology of the body uh, at Wednesday audiences in Rome. Now, this is before the internet, all right? That's how old I am, before the internet. And someone was faxing those talks that were published in Observatory Romano to a friend of mine at Notre Dame who was giving them to me. And uh, I decided I would teach Humanae Vitae in my classes and use these talks. And they were very persuasive. Again, so I decided again, I'm going to put this all together into a talk. And, uh, I'd been giving it for some time before 1993, but not that much. So 1993, I, I delivered it um, at, the spe at the talk in Omaha, and then after that, it was recorded, and it's been out there since. So let me give you a little context for the background of the church's teaching on contraception. Luther, all Christians, all Christians were opposed to contraception until 1930 when the Anglican Church first broke the unbroken tradition. Now, tell me if you would like to see this in an encyclical. This is what Luther says. The purpose of marriage is not pleasure and ease, but the procreation and education of children and the support of a family. People who do not like children are swine, dunces, and blockheads, not worthy to be called men and women, because they despise the blessings of God the Creator and author of marriage. I perhaps like that too much, but I do, <laughs> I do love it, all right? Gandhi was opposed uh, to contraception. Gandhi said there can be no two opinions about the necessity of birth control, but the only method handed down from ages past is self-control. It's an infallible sovereign remedy doing good to those who practice it, and medical men will earn the gratitude of mankind if instead of devising artificial means of birth control, they will find out the means of self-control. That's Gandhi, the Hindu. He went on to say, artificial methods are like putting a premium upon vice. They make man and woman reckless, and the respectability that is being given to the methods must hasten the dissolution of the restraints that public opinion puts upon one. Adoption of artificial methods must result, he thought, in imbecility and nervous prostration. We could maybe substantiate that. The remedy will be found to be worse than the disease. Now, contraception not only was taught to be wrong by all Christian churches up until 1930, it was illegal to sell it, to use it, to distribute it in the United States. And those laws were put on the books by a man named Anthony Comstock, who I believe was a Presbyterian minister. And he had made a trip to New York City and seen all sorts of licentious behavior. Uh, saw, learned of promiscuous sex, learned of uh, uh, lascivious dancing. Uh, and he attributed this to, and he saw porn, he attributed all of this to contraception. He said that it's the wide use of contraception that makes people think that sex is something to just be played with rather than to be serious about. And. Uh, at the time, the only contraceptives that were available were the condom and the diaphragm, right? The pill wasn't invented until the early 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. So those, the laws were put on, the, uh, on the virtually every state in the United States uh, by Protestant legislators, not Catholics. Catholics did a lot to keep them on the books, but Protestants put them there. The last of those laws were lifted in 1965 in the Supreme Court case Griswold versus the state of Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut was one of the last states that had those laws on their books. That was eight years um, before uh, Roe versus Wade. But it was pretty darn clear that once you got rid of laws against contraception, again, and once contraception became widely available, you were going to need abortion, right? And it fall and in the right in Griswold versus Connecticut is where the phrase right to privacy was introduced. That the government 
could not have a say on what went on in the bedroom. And then later that same right to privacy was said that the government doesn't have any say to what happens in a woman's womb. But of course what happens in a woman's womb is their new little baby is occupying that place who also has rights. In 1917, Margaret Sanger established uh, Planned Parenthood, one of the most vicious organizations that has ever, ever existed. And it's one of the great um, shames of our time that the government has supported it. Uh, she was a eugenicist. That means that she wanted to clean up the population. She wanted to get rid of the undesirables by promoting contraception. And these are her words in her uh, journal. Like the advocates of birth control, the eugenists, for instance, are seeking to assist the race toward the elimination of the unfit. She was going to eliminate the unfit. Both are seeking a single end, but they lay emphasis upon different methods. Eugenics without birth control seems to us a house builded upon the sands. It is at the mercy of the rising stream of the unfit. And the rising stream of the unfit were blacks and immigrants who were mostly Roman Catholics, right? So she wanted to get rid of immigrants and blacks. As you know, the black community has a much higher rate of abortion than all other um, segments of the population. It is a kind of um, genocide against the black community. And we stand by and allow it to happen. That started in 1917. Fast forward a bit, it's a very sad thing that one of the doctors had a major role in inventing the contraceptive pill was John Rock, a Catholic, right, a Catholic. You'll notice now in the Senate, uh, in the government, I mean, it's Catholics who are, or some Catholics are very pro-abortion, right? And they're the ones who push for abortion. Catholics don't have a good record, those in the um, professions and in the uh, public sphere. And John Rock was quite uh, unscrupulous. He knew that the early forms of contraception uh, could result in the inability of a new little human being to implant in its mother's wall, and that there would be a thin endometrium that would slough off the new little human being. He knew that, but he kept going in inventing a contraceptive pill. He did studies on the contraceptive pill in Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico is a poor Catholic country, and he thought that if he could get poor Catholics to approve of contraception, it would be widely accepted. As I said, the world was, people were afraid of overpopulation. If you could get Catholics accepting contraception, you know, maybe problem solved. The problem was that three women died in the first test group uh, in Puerto Rico, and they just adjusted the dosage of the contraceptives. Women are still dying from heart attacks, strokes, some forms of cancer from, from the contraceptive uh, pill. And the truth is, contraceptives are almost tested, almost always tested in third world countries. Because if women get sick or they die, which they do, uh, they don't sue because they don't have the resources to sue the pharmaceuticals. So the pharmaceuticals test these things on third world women. So let's review for a moment what the church is teaching is and how it came about. There's a big fat book about that called Contraception, a history of its treatment by the Catholic theologians and canonists by a man named John T. Noonan. John T. Noonan wrote one of the very best books there is against contraception uh, called uh, something like Abortion, Almost an Absolute Right in History. Very sophisticated uh, lawyer and historian of the law. He wrote this book, I think, in 1964, uh, which was four years before Humanae Vitae, and it was written with the intention of helping the church change its teaching. He thought this was a teaching that could change. But he said some things in his book which were uh, very revealing, in fact, showed great integrity on his part. He acknowledged that there's been an unbroken tradition in the church. I'm not going to read the whole of this passage, but the first sentence, first two, and then the last. Since the first clear mention of contraception by, Christian, uh, by a Christian the theologian, when a harsh third century moralist accused uh, a pope of encouraging it, the articulated judgment has been the same. In the world of the late Roman, the late empire known as St. Jerome and St. Augustine, and he talks all over the world, different ages, different places, the church has, it says, the teachers of the church 
have taught without hesitation or variation that certain acts of preventing procreation are gravely evil. As you know, this is considered to be a sign of the truth and maybe even the infallibility of a teaching if it's always been taught at all times and all places. And then he goes on to say that no Catholic theologian has ever taught contraception is a good act. They sort of say, well, it might be necessary at times, but not that it's a good thing. And he says the teaching on contraception is clear and apparently fixed forever. That where he puts a lot of weight on apparently, all right, because he's going to give a lot of reasons why he thinks it can change. And largely his, his argument was that in different periods of time, the church offered different kinds of arguments against contraception. And that suggests to him that it's a fluid teaching because we didn't have one set of definitive arguments against contraception. But that's a curious, uh, curious argument. I mean, few of us disagree that adultery is wrong. And there's a whole host of reasons you can give for adultery being wrong, right? It's a violation of the commandment against adultery. It's a violation of a vow you've taken to your wife before and your husband before God. It's a betrayal of your spouse. It's a betrayal of your children. It's extremely damaging to the children. It's very bad for the culture. You can get a whole host of reasons. It's almost, wouldn't we expect that if something is very, very wrong, <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of reasons uh, why it's wrong. And some of them we might not discover until later periods in history. It's a curious argument that he gave, but it was very powerful at the time. One of the most clear and wonderful explanations of the church's teaching is in, in the encyclical Costi Canubi by Pius XI, put out in 1930. As I mentioned, that was the same year that the Lambeth Conference was held, where the Anglicans for the first time broke with the unbroken tradition of Christian churches and said that for serious reasons, uh, couples within marriage could use contraception. Pius XI, again, uh, uh, wrote Costi Canubi. It's a beautiful document, much worth reading. What surprises people is that there was no dissent from Costi Canubi. There was no debate within the church for another couple decades about contraception. Theologians accepted it, priests accepted it, lay Catholics lived it at a remarkable uh, rate of fidelity, right? even though the rest of the culture was starting to begin a very contraceptive culture, uh, using again the diaphragm or the condom or uh, interu coitus interruptus, interrupting the sexual act, but Catholics weren't, and Catholics were having large families. There's an interesting book called An American History, Catholics and Contraception by Leslie Woodcock Tentler. This is another book that's in service of trying to get the church to change its teaching on contraception. But what she tells is a story that is quite, um, <laughs> I find it beautiful how faithful Catholics were to this teaching, again, in a culture that was largely becoming a contraceptive culture. And she says that, um, well, let's, let's read this and I'll say some more. She tells us early on in the book, many laity, during, between 1917 and about 1970 or so, she says many laity admired their church's increasingly lonely defense of a procreative sexual ethic. Many shared their clergy's anxieties when it came to emancipated views of sex. And a great many Catholics responded with a visceral surge of tribal loyalty. That's who you are today. You're responding with a visceral surge of tribal loyalty coming together. They responded that way when public proponents of birth control attacked the Catholic Church. The story was one of idealism too, especially after the Second World War, when the teaching was increasingly presented in personalist terms and in a context of national prosperity. The Catholics were having children and enjoying it. Um, she says it was given, the arguments were increasingly personalist. You know, Catholics were very educated, honestly, about much of church uh, teaching and doctrine. And part of it was because, and some of you will remember this, in Advent and in Lent, there would be, called, there would be missions, parish missions, and a redemptorist or a passionist or a Jesuit would come for four or five days of the week, and every night for an hour, hour and a half or so, would give a talk on something about church teaching. And Wednesday was generally considered to be the sex night. Uh, where there was an explanation of why, why masturbation, fornication, and contraception were wrong, right? So Catholics were taught, often twice a year. 
She went in, Leslie went, Woodcock Tentler went into the archives of the Diocese of, of Detroit and discovered that there was what called a syllabus of topics for homilies every year. And on that syllabus was that every year priests were expected to speak against contraception. So Catholics were not blindly obeying, uh, obeying the church's teaching. They were taught and they understood and they accepted uh, the church's teaching. When the uh, contraceptive pill came out, obviously it was different from the diaphragm and the condom because both of these were barrier methods. You have to basically put them on in prox very close proximity or during the sexual act, and they were actually a barrier, physical barrier between the male and the female, between sperm and egg meeting. But some people thought, well, maybe the pill is different. What the pill does, it might, might be it just increases the infertile period for a woman, so maybe it's acceptable. And then theologians looked into it and decided, no, it, also, it violates the principles behind the church's teaching on contraception. And in 1962, in theological studies, the Theological Journal of the United States, the author said, since theological discussion of the anovulant drugs, the pill, began some four or more years ago, moralists have never been less than unanimous in their assertion that natural law cannot countenance the use of these progestational steroids for the purpose of contraception, as that term is properly understood in the light of papal teaching. So it goes on, this author goes on to say this, again, this teaching seems to be final. Uh, it's not in doubt, right? Three years later, the same journal published a, a statement that says the teaching is now in doubt. It's in dubia, which means, again, in a certain sense, couples are free to do what they want about the topic. Well, in, 19, in the early 1960s, John the, 20, John the 23rd set up a special commission to look at the question of contraception. Not that he was saying, allowing the speculation that the church could change its teaching. Instead, he was asking them to figure out how to defend this teaching in the modern world, where it seemed that contraception was gonna be widely accepted, and the UN was already uh, having conferences with concern about overpopulation, and putting pressure on the Catholic Church to change its teaching, or at least back off on promotion of its teaching. And so he said, how are we going to present this teaching with this new problem, the claim that the world is overpopulated? When he uh, died, Pope Paul VI became Pope, and he took over that special commission and expanded it to some 66 members, uh, most of them lay people, doctors, demographers, sociologists, family life directors, uh, leaders of um, marriage and family life movements, and asked them the same thing. How can we teach this teaching in the modern world? That whole story is told in this book called Turning Point by Robert McClory. Now he's a dissenter, uh, but again, it, it's a very good telling of the story. And the story was that this commission began to meet and under the direction of Father Bernard Herring, who was the um, most world-renowned moral theologian in the church, he was a member of the commission, he, he persuaded the commission to take up the topic, could and should the church change its teaching on contraception? That was not the mandate of the commission, but he decided to change the mandate of the, of the commission. At the same, on the same commission was John Noonan. He wasn't, I don't know that he was a voting member, but he was an, an expert who was advising uh, the members of the commission. But also a John Ford, a Jesuit, Father John Ford, a remarkable Jesuit, US Jesuit. And he saw that this commission was what he called a runaway commission. And so he went over and had a couple meetings with Paul VI and tried to persuade Paul VI to disband the, commu uh, the commission because they were taking up a topic they hadn't been directed to take up. Paul VI said, no, we're gonna let it go its course, but he put 15 new members on the commission, not all new ones, but he made 15 people the voting uh, members, all of them high churchmen, bishops, archbishops, and cardinals. At the same time, he sent over a number of footnotes to the Vatican Council, which was meeting at the same time, footnotes that connected the church's teaching all the way back, which again is meant to be a sign that this is in fact the church teaching, and use those as footnotes for the section of Gaudium et Spes that speaks about contraception, actually a beautiful uh, sections, 48 through 51. But when a vote came for the special commission, 
Nine said yes, the church could and should change its teaching. Three said no, and three abstained. If you had taken a vote among the laity, it would have been overwhelmingly uh, that the church could and should change its teaching. Now, it was astonishing, astonishing that that happened. Uh, it was astonishing that the two foremost moral theologians in the world, Bernard Herring and Joseph Fuchs, were both on that commission and both of them uh, said the church could and should change its teaching. This goes a very long way to explain why dissent spread so quickly through the church. The major theologians in the world had studied under Herring or Fuchs or followed them closely. And so their students, when they flipped on the issue, their students all over the world flipped on the issue of contraception. In the United States, Father Charles Curran stood on the steps of the Catholic University of America and uh, said that Catholics did not need to abide by this teaching. It was based on an inadequate notion of natural law and couples should be free to do what they thought best in accord with their own consciences. From there on out, articles by Charles Kern and Bernard Herring, Fuchs didn't write a lot about it. He, I think he was a little bit um, not so proud of this moment, but still he, he went along. But Bernard and Herring, they're, they're, it was their stuff that was used in seminaries and uh, universities from there on out, about 1969, 1970. It was, it was a done deal. The teachers in the seminaries and the teachers in the universities were almost all dissenters. So that's what priests were taught well up until the 90s when the catechism came out, well up until the 90s. Uh, seminaries were filled with dissenting theologians. Some of us are making some connections between that and the crisis of the homosexual presence in the priesthood. That the uh, priests were taught that the church was wrong about contraception and would eventually change its teaching. And therefore we're teaching that sex between, that sex that doesn't have a procreative element in it is perfectly moral, right? And if sex is just for pleasure, then why not anybody who wants to have sex with each other? Why not men with men and women with women? And so <coughs> at the same time that contraception was being dissented against, soon there was dissent against the wrongness of masturbation, homosexuality, divorce, etc. Cardinal Boyle was the Cardinal of Washington, D.C. at the time. 150 of his priests signed a statement of dissent against Humanae Vitae said they would not teach it and preach it. He reported this to Rome. No, he didn't, they did. They protested to Rome that he had suspended some of their faculties because of their signing the statement of dissent. And Rome backed the priests rather than Cardinal Boyle. That's stunning, right? But why did they? They did, they because, they did it because they were afraid that there was going to be a schism in the Catholic Church, right? that when I taught at Notre Dame in the 1980s, there was constant talk of a schism, that sometime there might be a Roman Catholic Church and an American Catholic Church. An American Catholic Church would just break off from Rome. We would have our own doctrine and our own church. As you know, there's that concern now about the German Catholic Church, about whether if um, the Rome came really down hard on them to, to, to um, preach church teaching on a number of matters, they just might say, well, we're just gonna be our own church. We're gonna be the German Catholic Church and not um, uh, linked with, with Rome. And you will have noticed that in the last um, 50 years, probably very few of you have heard a homily on contraception or humanae vitae. Maybe the first one in the last two months, because <laughs> those are happening now, but for the last 50 years they have not. All right, Cardinal Schoenburn had something amazing to say about another petition and the petition, both the petition that was happening at the time of um, Humanae Vitae and another. Charles Kern got over 600 people to sign a petition, mostly theologians, uh, teachers of religion. Cardinal Schoenburn had this, he said, Cardinal Schoenburn accused the signatories of weakening the people of God's sense for life. So that when the wave of abortions and increasing acceptance of homosexuality followed, the church lacked the courage to oppose them. There were a few memorable exceptions. In 1968, the Cardinal said, one of which was in Krakow, where a group of theologians led by the Archbishop and Cardinal of Krakow, 
the future Pope John Paul II, drew up a memorandum which was sent to Pope Paul VI urging him to write Humanae Vitae. Those bishops, said Cardinal Schoenberg, were frightened of the press and of being misunderstood by the faithful. They wouldn't support John Paul II. Blame lay not only with the bishops who didn't support John Paul II, responsible at the time, none of whom is still alive, but with all the bishops for the fact that Europe is about to die out. I mean, talk about a population problem. They're, European countries are not reproducing themselves. Right? The only way that they're able to fill the jobs they need is for immigration, which explains why Germany sort of has an open borders uh, policy. He says, I think it is also our sin as bishops, even if none of us were bishops in 1968, he added. Bishops have not had or did not have the courage to swim against the tide and say yes to humane vitae, he said. This was several years ago, and I said we have lots of good bishops now, all right, who are willing to do this, so we live in a, a changing times, right? Cardinal Stafford tells of his own experience. He was a priest of about seven or eight years when humane vitae came out, and the minute he came out, one of the priests in Baltimore called a meeting of all the bishops in Baltimore in the, uh, the basement of an inner city church. And this was at the same time that there were race riots going on in Baltimore. And Cardinal Stafford has a, a talent for uh, capturing, capturing the drama of the moment. He was just seven or eight years a priest. And he says in the violence, he called it violence, this priest meeting, that they were violently being asked to sign, he calls it a, a petition against Humanae Vitae. It had just come out. Almost none of them had read it, maybe none of them. The violence of the priest's August gathering gave rise to its own ferocious um, acrimony. Conversations among the clergy where they existed became contaminated with fear. Suspicions among priests were chronic, fears abounded, and they continue. The archdiocesan priesthood lost something of the fraternal whole which Baltimore priests had known for generations. Some, saw priests, some priests saw bishops as nothing more than Roman mannequins, bishops who supported the church's teaching. So he said was in this room, this priest held up a copy of Humanae Vitae and said that he was going to go around the room and ask how many would sign a petition against it. He had to say it aloud. They hadn't read the document. They all said yes until it got to Stafford, who was the last man in the room. And he said, no, I'm not going to sign it. And again, he said, from that time, there was a, a broken fraternity among priests. It used to be before 1968, basically, basically, that if a priest saw another priest with a collar, he was a comrade in arms, right? He's his brother. We're fighting the same fight. We're on the same team. And then after 1968, you sort of had to find out where he stood. Are you on the dissenting side or are you on the supporting side of Humanae Vitae? You had a fractured priesthood. He says... Um, Something else happened among priests on that violent August night. Friendship in the church sustained a direct hit. Jesus, by calling those who were with him his friends, had made friendship a privileged analogy of the church. That analogy became obscured after a large number of priests expressed shame over their teachings and repudiated their teaching. He said, abuse of course of dissent has become a reality in the church and subjects her to violent, debilitating, unproductive, chronic controversies but I did not discover some, but I did discover something new. Others also did. When the moment of Christian witness came, no Christian could be coerced who refused to do so. You can imagine being the, a very young priest with all your brother priests in the room saying that they will dissent from Humanae Vitae, and you're the only one that doesn't. <laughs> I took a great act of courage. He says, I did it, I did it. He said, nobody could coerce me. So he said, despite the novelty of being treated as an object of shame and ridicule. I did not become ashamed of the gospel that night and found sweet delight in what is right. It was not a bad lesson. Ecclesial obedience ran the distance. You can read all, a lot about this in a book by the great late Ralph McInerney, What Went Wrong with Vatican II. It's not what went wrong with Vatican II. It's really about all the dissent that was unleashed by Humanae Vitae, and that people thought that you could read Humanae Vitae and what's called the spirit of Humanae Vitae, and, I mean the spirit of Vatican II, and you could read the documents of Vatican II. Anyway, it's a great book. So let me say a few things about one of the great gifts that has come to the church since Humanae Vitae was written. I, I occasionally say, and I'll say right now, that I think in some respects Humanae Vitae is as much John Paul II's 
um, document as it was Paul VI. John Paul II had, um, since his early priesthood, had a passion uh, for defending the church's teaching on sexuality, including contraception. That's in the 1950s in Poland, long before it became a really public issue, but he seemed to sense something was coming. I'd love to know what he knew <laughs> that was coming. So one thing, I think when the, when the Holy Spirit was looking for someone to be the new pope in 1978, he was looking around the world. I mean, he needed someone who was brilliant, who could explain the dignity of the human person, who had fought communism, who taught a preferential option for the poor. But John Paul II was the, I think, the single person on earth that was most able to defend the church's teaching on sexuality. And we needed it, all right? He was only 58 years of age, right? 58, he was made the Holy Father. Back in 1959 or so, he wrote this beautiful book called Love and Responsibility which is a philosophical defense of the church's teaching on sexuality, including contraception. It's a brilliant and excellent book, one of the classics, I think, of Western civilization. Throughout um, for the 50s, 60s, 70s, he wrote scholarly articles on Humanae Vitae. He defended Humanae Vitae relentlessly after he became Holy Father. He was actually a member of the special commission that advised Pope Paul VI on writing Humanae Vitae but he was not permitted to leave uh, communist Poland. He couldn't get a visa for the purposes of meeting with the special commission, but he got their documents. And when the documents came out of that commission and there was a majority report that said the church should and could change its teaching, he put together a special commission in Krakow of five priests, theologians, and a doctor. And they wrote a beautiful document that defended the church's teaching that he gave to Paul VI before Paul VI wrote Humanae Vitae. I think he had considerable influence on the writing of Humanae Vitae. He was actually one of the few bishops that was really trying to help uh, the church maintain its teaching. Just this week, a new letter was uh, discovered, a uh, never before published letter of Cardinal Wojtyla to Pope Paul VI on Humanae Vitae. There's been a new volume of a study of the archival uh, materials around Humanae Vitae, and they discovered a letter that, previously unknown, that Wojtyla had written Paul VI to say, this is, is infallible teaching. You really should stress that. This is infallible on the basis of the ordinary magisterium. Now, Paul VI did not do that, but John Paul II sounded that note several times in his pontificate. He wrote The Theology of the Body, right? Theology of the Body, which has been the single best uh, gift for defending the church's teaching in the last 50 years. He wrote the whole thing before he became Holy Father, right? He wrote the whole thing. And then he chopped it up into little pieces and delivered it at Wednesday audiences because somebody in the Vatican told him that popes couldn't publish books. So he said, well, okay, I can give addresses. <laughs> I'll give addresses. And then when Benedict became Holy Father, he said, what the heck, I'm publishing books if I want to, I'm the Pope, right? <laughs> now the terminology, this was a fascination with John Paul II, a theme of his pontificate. His terminology and his, his thoughts appear in Familiaris Consortio. The catechism in a certain sense was written to end dissent in the church that began with Humanae Vitae. Veritatis Splendor in a certain sense even more so. It's the only document of the church encyclical ever on moral theology, and it's explicit in there that he wanted to put an end to the teaching of proportionalism in the seminaries. That's 19, what is it, 95, 93, 93? Okay, dissent was in the seminaries all over the place, and he wrote this document in order to put an end to dissent in the seminaries. And then we have Evangelium Vitae. He traveled all over the world. Wherever he went, he gave talks on contraception and NFP. He established institutes for marriage and the family all over the world. Um, the good news is, is there's so many John Paul II priests. There was a, there's conferences this year, I said 40, that 19, two or three years ago, a couple of us put together this um, affirmation of the church's teaching because there was a new assault on the UN by Catholic theologians who were telling the UN that they didn't need to listen to the Catholic Church on contraception. So a number of us, wrote this affirmation. It's available on the Catholic University of America website. 
over f within, a, within a weekend's time, we got 500 people with advanced degrees to sign on to support this document. It was extraordinary. This year, Catholic University held the most academic conference on Humanae Vitae. What a delightful thing that it happened at Catholic U, where Charles Curran started the dissent, and the president was there, John McCarthy, and he was in McGarvey. He was incredibly proud to be holding this conference at CUA, to say CUA is the church's university. There's this marvelous uh, conference uh, this weekend. There's been them all over the place. So I'm very grateful uh, for the laity. I really think it has been the laity that has defended the church's teaching on contraception, has kept the teaching alive. John Henry Newman uh, wrote a, a very important work on what's called the census fidelium, the sense of the faithful. And it's true that in the history of the church, what the laity believes is very important to helping the church sustain its teaching. He was writing at the time uh, where they were trying to determine whether the, it was the doctrine, or the, propo the proposed doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, of Mary being immaculately conceived, was in fact true and was a doctrine that Catholics were obliged to uh, accept. There's only been two doc doctrines that have been ex cathedra uh, in infallibly proclaimed. One is, the, they're both Marian, Immaculate Conception and the Assumption of Marriage, but this was back in mid 19th century. And what they did was they consulted the faithful. And what did that mean? They asked people who had profound devotions to Mary, saying the rosary daily, making pilgrimages, doing novenas to marriage, Mary, and they asked them, do you think Mary was immaculately conceived? And they said, oh, absolutely. <laughs> that's absolutely fitting with our understanding of her. And they said, if that's what Catholics believe who have this intimate familiarity with marriage believe, that's not definitive, but it's a sign. Now you're gonna be hearing in this year that the sense of the faithful is that uh, contraception is not in accord with Christian teaching because 98% of Catholics have in fact contracepted. At any given time, 85% are using some form of contraception or sterilization. They say the tr church teaching has never been received by the faithful. Well, first of all, the census fidelium had nothing to do with reception of the teaching. It had something to do with the formulation of a teaching. I bet Catholics, 98% of us have lied at some time, maybe even stolen, all right? Um, does that mean that the teachings against stealing and lying have not been received, or it just means we're little sinners, right? And then you add to it that many of these Catholics don't go to church, right? They don't go to church, they don't go to mass, they don't go to confession. They don't accept other teachings of the church. So we're not talking about people a sense, uh, uh, you're not, it's just because you put Catholic and check it off of something that that's where you've been baptized or something doesn't mean, obviously, that you accept the wholeness of the faith. So if you consult the faithful, I'm voting for you, all right? These are the people um, to, to, to consult because you paid a price, all right? You paid a price uh, for your fidelity to church teaching. All right, I'm just pulling, the, landing the plane right on time, and I just want to leave you with this image, all right? Just remember, all right, the pill is a no-no. Thank you very much.